Well, first of all, I think intuition is, I don't think it's necessarily well understood, but it's an incredibly powerful part of human psychology, part of human, the mind. Because I think you're in intuition, you're taking all kinds of variables and sort of munging them together with certain experiences that you have that kind of validate or invalidate maybe other types of stimulus that are coming in. And you're kind of saying, I think this, and you don't necessarily even have all the facts. That's intuition or that's gut. I think that you know, look, when it comes to leading, there are such things as natural leaders, but you, I think to be a really effective leader in the long haul, I think you need to be, you need to intellectualize some of that. You need to know what parts of what you, your gut are right and why, and then begin to build a framework of reasoning for that. Mm. So that becomes sort of the, sort of the foundation for what, what is, what is good leadership look like. Welcome to Warriors at Work. This is Jeannie Coomber, your guide and host. Warriors at Work is a place where everyone in the workplace can come together, gain insight, encouragement, tell stories, connect, and share wisdom. We are a place of like-minded people at different stages of life, all coming together with a shared interest of enlightening and inspiring one another. If you're interested in going from the predictable to the potent, and you want to find your warrior magic, step into the journey with us. Welcome to Warriors at Work. Hi, everybody. It's Jeannie. Thank you so much for joining me here at the Warriors at Work podcast. I have had the absolute pleasure of interviewing Dave Falter. And the conversation that you're about to hear is all about leadership philosophy and not in the traditional C-suite CEO approach, but really tangibly how to lead with and through people, how to create an environment of servant leadership. My next guest truly embodies so many of the warrior attributes that we have talked about since the beginning of the Warriors at Work experience. Everything from optimism to possibility thinking to courage. Dave is a six-time CEO and board director who has successfully led companies ranging from $25 million to more than a billion across numerous industries. He talks about his personal mission to inspire dedication, hard work, and loyalty among everyone that he works with. His expertise runs the gamut. You're going to hear a lot of his CEO perspective, but also his business savvy through this conversation. But more than anything, you're going to feel his heart, his care for employees, his care for mission, purpose, and value. And I felt so privileged to be able to have this conversation with him and provide this perspective to all of you here at the Warriors at Work community. Enjoy. Thank you, everybody, for joining me on this fabulous episode of the Warriors at Work podcast. I am thrilled to have with me a very interesting and multifaceted leader, Dave Falter. So, Dave, thank you so much for being in this conversation with me today. It's my great pleasure. Thanks for having me. So here, Dave, there, you're such a fascinating guy. I did a lot of research about you before we came into this conversation, and you and I had the opportunity to talk and get to know each other. And there's a couple of things that struck me about you and your background. You're referred to as a CEO, a board director, an author, a blogger, a consultant, and a leadership development thought leader. How do you describe you? Interestingly enough, probably the one word that's not in there is coach. And I think that is the that is the thing that I find most interesting. That is the thing that energizes me. I think that's probably that modality or, or sort of that projection on myself is the thing that I think it creates my most effective leadership moments with others. Uh, I think coaching tends to be a, a kind of an interesting amalgam of things that you know, things that mm. you believe, and then sort of how you use those things as a crucible to help others, you know, find their best selves. I love that word crucible. Yeah, it can be kind of hot sometimes. Yeah. So is is there a particular example that's coming to mind where you are like, I I really brought out the best in somebody else. You really use this word effective leadership. Is there did you have a crucible moment that comes to mind that really amplifies that point? 
Well, I've had I've had many. I mean, I'm pleased to say I've had many. Um, part of what I've done, both as an executive leader in my own my own sort of resume, as it were, my own career, but also uh, as a consultant for a number of years, where a big part of what I did was executive coaching, is I I had many crucible moments. Um, uh, some of them were about helping very promising executives sort of see why they were promising. They they, they kind mm-hmm. of believed it, but they didn't really understand how it was manifesting, how how they could manifest it, for that matter. Or how it was manifesting itself into their career, into their uh, into their peer group, obviously into their larger organization. In some cases, it was um, executives who were modeling the wrong behaviors. Frankly, uh, mm. they had either come up through, um, you know, either because of challenges they had as children, and in terms of how their parents taught them how to act, behave, think, um, or where executives had, you know, unfortunately the the. The poor, the bad fortune of executives or executive leaders, a couple of cases and people who had military uh, executive leaders, where they weren't taking the best of those leaders' uh, practices or principles, and they were kind of modeling the, the bad stuff, um, and were not breaking through. Uh, they were not being identified as as rising leaders in their own organizations, or in a couple of cases where they had left kind of corporate America and had gone to start their own businesses. Um, were really struggling with growing their businesses, be- and they were the problem. Mm. They were the problem. Uh, so those were all crucible moments that were, uh, you know, for me, incredibly important. I think in terms of feeling like I was, I was effective. Uh, but most important is that they became effective. They became much more effective and began to realize some of their goals. On you know whether that was for the business itself or their own personal career journey. So let's let's talk more about you and your particular experience in the world, because you shared with me when we were preparing for this conversation that you are an executive who has not had a career. So say more about that. Well, you know, I, <laughs> I did share that with you. I think it was a private moment. No, I'm just joking. I, I, <laughs> oh, well, I we're out of the open been. now. I think, you know, my career is more like a quilt. Um, it, it does have thematic underpinnings. Like I've always pretty much been a technology executive. I've had a couple of small deviations, but for the most part, I've always been in the, in the technology industry in one way or another. Um, but the way in which I found the jobs that I took, you know, I'm not the guy with the 30 years or 40 years who's going to get the gold watch. I've had a lot of different jobs and that was not always, um, understandable by, uh, prospective employers, by the executive recruitment community, et cetera. From based on my vintage, and I'm a, I'm a very young boomer, but I'm a, in the boomer vintage, um, where people stayed in jobs for you know a decade at a time. I mean, I, I the longest uh, job I've held was eight years, and that was a business I owned myself. Um, mm. So I, I think that um, my career has been largely driven by inquiry and interest and problem solving. So uh, my wife and I joke a little bit that I've never met a problem I didn't like. And she says, that's actually one of the reasons why you sometimes <laughs> make interesting choices about what you're going to do. But I've always been very interested in running business or le- leading businesses. And, you know, frankly, those businesses or their owners or their boards of directors have found me and s- sort of said, we understand that you like to solve problems and we've got some hairy ones here that we'd like to take a look at. And inevitably, I see things that I think I know how to fix. Um, and there's always going to be things that are going to be broken that no one either knows or they're not telling you. Um, and, and, you know, then you have to decide, do I know how to fix that too? But it's not all about you anyway. You're going to be, be, be gathering a group of exceptional executives who will help you solve those problems together. Um, so, you know, I think it's a little bit like frost in a way with the road, you know, the road not taken, you know, I take, I took the path less, well, I took the one less traveled by and that's made all the difference I think is the quote. And, um, you know, Frost wasn't in that poem judging. He was just simply saying, I took a different path and Mm -hmm. it's led me to where I am. Um, So I did have a father who was a government executive, uh, very ended up being a very successful civilian in the Air Force. Um, But he was like, you know, that 30 year guy. And as soon as he kind of got his 30 years, man, he punched out. Um, And he was a super smart guy and a very keen problem solver. But he kind of kept it really narrow banded, as it were. And I've always found that problems, the kinds of problems that I like to solve for exist all over business. Uh, and so they've taken me. So anyway, long answer to a short question. But my career is sort of this winding path, this sort of quilt of lots of different things. Yeah, the, the word that I was thinking of is like portfolio. 
your 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 the the headline is I like to solve problems, and within is like all these different um, divisional lines of experiences in a portfolio, and you slide in and out of the portfolio. So that's kind of what I was seeing. Is like, oh, it's it's a it's a, it's a leader who has a portfolio mentality. Is through each experience, oh, there's something else I'm going to add to my portfolio. But it's all driven by your affinity for solving problems. I mean, that's amazing. Because I'm also thinking about you are not in a position where you are flustered by that problem. You're you're actually inviting the problem in, which is kind of interesting. I usually it, it it means more that you you don't shy away from difficult conversations. You are not having any difficulty with experiencing something that's uncomfortable. It's like you really lean in. Is that an accurate depiction of well, how you're yeah. wired? Well, first of all, that's very generous, but yes, I think that's accurate. I mean, if the portfolio analogy or metaphor is, I think, accurate. Um, you know, I think my the major theme is growth. I, I'm fascinated mm -hmm. by why things do grow. I'm fascinated by things why, why things don't grow. Back in the days, many of our listeners probably don't even remember this, maybe we weren't even in the workforce back in the dot-com boom and prior, there was all kinds of growth that was occurring, but it was kind of a natural growth. And I was fascinated by that too, where lots of money was coming in to finance ideas that were often not good. And the businesses kind of grew, but they, I used to call them sort of radioactive cucumbers. Like they grew, but they were they, <laughs> they didn't really exist in reality and they, they couldn't sustain themselves, et cetera. So, you know, so I, I think, yeah, I was a portfolio executive, very fair way to characterize me, who's really interested in the problems or challenges around growth. Sometimes you have to fix the business to grow, right? Mm. Sometimes the business has all kinds of characteristic elements of why it can be a grower, but it's not growing. And then you sort of figure out why. Um, and then sometimes, of course, it's growing like a weed. And, you know, growth kills more businesses than lack of business, largely because it has a direct connection to cash and cash flow. And most executives are not experienced in cash flow management or they've been good at their functional role. And someone else is like a CFO or treasury function or what have you has had the responsibility of managing cash. And, you know, the things are going gangbusters. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, we actually ran out of gas and we've just reached 30,000 feet. Uh, did anybody remember how to fill the tanks at 30,000 feet? So, you know, th that's that's a fascinating uh, uh, challenge as well. So I've, I've worked with, you know, hyper growth companies that are very young and, and very new. I've worked with large mature companies that still have growth opportunities, but they have to kind of reimagine certain dimensions of their business and their marketplace access. And I work with a whole host of businesses that, you know, have good bones, but they just really don't know how to get there. So I, mm. I, find, that, I find that all that to be very, very interesting. And as I said earlier, it's not all about me. I mean, it's like, I'm not going to solve these problems alone, but I am going to, I get interested in the problem and I drag people in like, oh my right. God, he's got another problem. But, you know, I drag them in to solve the problem with me. Yeah, because I'm, I'm going to break down to some of your uh, philosophies around leadership and management, because I think it's really oh. fascinating and apropos to this conversation. One of the things that you started to touch on is is your dad. So what I want to do is take a, take a step back and let's look at how you became who you are. Like, who were those key influencers and mentors in, in your life that you think are critical to how you show up and how you perceive the world right now? Hmm. Uh, fair question for an interview like this. Uh, so I would say my father was not a strong influence on me as a businessman. Uh, my father and mother both, my father's deceased, so I'll speak with due respect, uh, was a very good executive uh, in the Air Force and sort of, you know, learned how to navigate that space and made some pretty significant contributions. But he was not a businessman. So he's not a profit oriented person. He was more like duty, mission, et cetera, which is kind of what you would expect. Um, so I did not grow up at the dinner table with business people like myself and my sons have grown up with a businessman uh, and a, a, a mom who is actually a pretty astute businesswoman, um, you know, at the table. So they are all very naturally kind of conversant with sort of the major concepts of business. Um, I actually started my career thinking I went, I was an aspiring academic. So I, I went to college and I went to graduate school, um, learned that, poly, that, 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 maybe the most politicized thing in the world is education and, and pedagogy. And I was like, I, don't, I just don't know if I can handle this stuff because I want to be a PhD and I want to be a doctor in English. And so I, I did work on that, do that work, but I realized also that um, I wasn't really sure uh, about the long-term economic opportunity in being uh, in professional academia. So, uh, so anyway, I left that, in that space and kind of wandered into 
computing almost by accident and really liked um, business, really liked making money. Um, and, you know, kind of I had the good, good fortune of working for some really nice logos in, in, the, in the late 80s, and early 90s in the technology industry. Um, and then I got this idea I wanted to start my own business which, uh, cause I was going to Kellogg at night. I went to Kellogg at night because I realized that no, I did not understand what anybody else was talking about <laughs> as a liberal <laughs> arts major. No, I mean, I knew how to write. I could sit, I could analyze, I could synthesize, I could do all that stuff. Very proud of that by the way, but I really didn't understand the context of business sort of okay. what, what, what are we trying to accomplish here sort of thing. Uh, so I was going to Kellogg at night, had the good fortune of being able to be a part of their evening program, which is uh, back in those days was, you know, I think you could graduate if you could stay awake because most people were having, <laughs> having babies, had hotshot careers, they were getting married, you know. So, uh, so anyway, I started this business uh, with a two, like a two page business plan. So that's how well thought it out what it was. But I started, I started a business and it actually started to grow. And I uh, hired a couple of people um, who were dumb enough to join me. <laughs> our, our power personality, I think, at that point in time. Um, and uh, one of them was an older gentleman who was definitely in his sunset years in terms of his career, but I think he was still, you know, kicking around, looking for something to do. He had been a computing guy back in the mainframe days, and so, you know, he knew what he, he, he kind of knew his way around computing. And uh, really nice guy, a guy named Jack, and, and he one day kind of, asked me if he could meet in my office and I said, sure. And kind of came in and said, you know, Hey Dave, I want to let you know something. Like, I think you're a really, really gifted guy. Like I think you're a smart guy. And I think you could really go somewhere in business, but you have no idea what you're doing. And I was like, you know, I wasn't mad because I was like, Oh shit, he's got me. Right. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, uh, he said, listen, I have two colleagues, guys that I used to work for who started their own consultancy. Mm. And I think that they would be a real help to you. And I'll say their names. One fellow is still alive. He's elderly and the other one's passed away regrettably, but they're, they were Dick Benkendorf and Ed Grant. And they, one, Ed Grant had been, uh, uh, in addition to being a very, very senior executive of Amdahl Corporation, he had also been the CEO of LaSalle Bank here in Chicago. So he was like a player and he was kind of in retirement had decided to kind of consult and work with early stage high growth companies to try to help them sort of realize their potential you know, take a small fee, maybe get some equity in the business and hopefully something would work out. The other guy, Dick Benkendorf, had been very, very senior executive at IBM, had been the president of ADP. I mean, like these guys were hitters. Mm -hmm. And I met him and we all just kind of liked each other right away. Um, those guys literally taught me. And I was going, I don't, you know, I was going to Kellogg and getting a formal business degree. Those guys taught me virtually everything I know about business. And they taught me it probably in about a year's time, but they stayed with me throughout the life of my company, which I started in 92, mm. I sold in late 99. They taught me about uh, how, to be a, how to be a CEO. They taught me about how to be a manager. They taught me uh, their own views about leadership, which I used you know, in part to form my own views about leadership. Uh, they taught me how to be a board director, how mm. to prepare board materials. Um, gosh, I mean, they helped me with supplier negotiations. They just really made me Oh my gosh, a materially better executive than I was. You know, I was running, you know, basically what fake it till you make it. I was kind of running on natural ability, which was clearly going to exhaust itself quickly. Mm -hmm. And um, so, anyway, those, th those are the major influences. I've had lots of other bosses, um, you know, as because I've been principally a CEO in most of my career, a lot of my bosses have been directors. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you always have a boss and shareholders. Yeah. Right? And you always have a boss and employees. So let's talk about musher management. Dave has this fantastic blog called Musher Management. Um, I would love for you to share the story about why you started a leadership blog called Musher Management. So uh, this would be like 2010, 2011. Um, I was trying to figure I had left, I had exited a private equity company and I was trying to figure out what I was going to do next. I mean, in many cases that for a lot of private equity executives, that's just a serial function. You kind of just wash, rinse and repeat. It's either the same business that you're, 
that you're sold and now you're running again or you get hired by another PE firm to run another thing. But I had taken a step away and tried to figure out what I wanted to do. And <clears throat> pardon me, and, and I, I, I kind of had this idea that I wanted to write a book about leadership and, um, and my leadership philosophy, which I call mushroom management, and I'll explain why. But it was, um, at the time, blogging was somewhat new. I mean, it wasn't brand new, but it was somewhat new. And I felt like there weren't enough leadership conversations happening kind of out there mm. in, the, in the ether, as it were. And I, I thought maybe a, be, a good way for me to begin to develop the content for a book <clears throat> was to begin to blog on observations that I was making about other executives that I was working with, uh, other executives that I was uh, observing, um, much, much, much later with the ordination of Pope Francis, I even wrote about him as a musher, what I thought that I thought he was a musher. And we can talk about what, what I think a musher is, but um, so it started out kind of as a blog on its way, or, or, you know, to, to create content to become um, a book. And I, I also found out that writing a book is really hard. So, it's, <laughs> so, <laughs> so it ended up just becoming a bigger and bigger, bigger blog. And what ended up happening, one of the reasons why it, I think I, I blogged for about four years. So people can go and see it. it's www.mushroommanagement.com, all one word. But it's you're gonna if those that come and visit it will find that it kind of stops in the 2014 2015 era. And one of the reasons why I stopped is that I I came to the realization that increasingly I was talking about difficult situations that my customers, because I was a consultant and I was a management consultant, I did a lot of coaching as a as a corollary of that were the topic of my observation and that, you know, I was building a viewer base and a reader mm. base rather. And I didn't want my customers to see themselves in print. And, you know, I was, I wasn't saying anything unkind about them, mm. but on the other hand, you know, the, the blog was probably about something, a challenge that they were experiencing that I was, uh, you know, analyzing or addressing. And I thought, you know, this is becoming, this is this is going to become a liability. So I so I stopped. But if you may, shall I tell you a little bit about mushroom management? Itself? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Why musher? So why musher? So musher is kind of an amalgam of different things. Musher is is there's part of it is uh, some observations that I had made or you know stored in my mind uh, in working for a, uh, a CEO who at one time actually had been a, a peer who really kind of didn't get it and had a very different sense of what leadership was. Uh, his idea of leadership was like, you know, if we crash in the jungle, I got the machete, you follow me, I hack my way through the jungle. If you don't follow me, you're dead. And, it's, you know, if, which was sort of in many ways based on his own behaviors was sort of amplified by a certain amount of narcissism. And I just didn't think that that was right, okay? It, was, it had nothing to do with the fact that he and I were peers and he became my boss, anything like that. I had always felt that he'd had these challenges. That, um, on, on top of the fact that for a number of years I had in my own mind sort of this leadership philosophy concept that was brewing that started with, when I had started reading about servant leadership and I started saying, that is me, that is, I, am the, I am that kind of executive. And I'll tell you a quick story about how I figured that out. Um, and then, actually experiencing dog sledding and sp spending time talking to um, people who actually provided the sledding experience, but more important, took care of the dogs and, and really understanding the mushroom, you know, really, really broke down the whole, the whole, the whole uh, exercise or the, the whole thing uh, of, mush of mushing, dog sledding. Um, the, the, the servant leadership came from my entrepreneurial days. So I had a lot, I, I learned a lot. I had Ed and Dick and I had a lot of learnings. Uh, but my business actually grew pretty substantially, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say it created enormous challenges and a lot of sleepless nights, but it also really grew. And, you know, I realized as I get from got from like employees three, four, five to employee 165, 167, 168 kind of thing, that I was losing control of them, as it were. I was losing we, we didn't necessarily, 168, even if that person was coming in as an EVP, let's say, and they usually, usually weren't, obviously, I didn't have the same relationship with them as I had with employees two or three or four. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I had built this thing upon which I was in, entirely reliant. 
In the early days, they were reliant on me. Is Dave going to make the right choices? Am I going to get a paycheck? Mm. Like, we're going to have a business tomorrow. But once the business actually began to kind of pick up steam and become a true enterprise, I, be, I just kind of came to the realization that everybody was going at home at night and making a decision the next day to come back and work for the business and mm. by proxy to come back and work for me. But it wasn't about me anymore. That I was now beholden to them. And I was like, oh, my God, I got to like, I got to like, find a new way to think about how I'm leading and running this thing. And so that began me, uh, the journey. And I just happened to stumble uh, uh, across servant leadership. And I said, you know, this is, this makes a lot of sense to me. So where it all came together in kind of a intellectual cataclysm as it were, or the light went on was when I went on this dog uh, sledding experience. So if people go to the website and they talk to hear about the parable of the musher, I am actually not that executive. I'm happy to say, but I observed that executive in another context. Mm. I inserted him into the story. And what I did learn was uh, this is the fundamental principle of musher management is it's, it's really about self-interested caretaking, self-interested caretaking. So the idea is you are building an environment. We call it culture now. But you're building an environment where your, your, your activity, your commitment to the best interests of your people will raise you up as the individual leader. And what you saw, what you see in dog sledding is that the dogs cannot survive without the musher and the musher cannot survive without the dogs. Mm. You cannot win the Iditarod pulling the sled without dogs, for instance, across the line. It would, be, it would be literally a 0% chance that would happen because you would have died well before then, right? Nor can the sled, the dogs pull the sled across the line without the musher on the back. So everybody's got to do this together. You've got to be in it together. So the principles of self-interested caretaking are how do you translate the things that naturally kind of ended up falling into the bucket when you're the CEO, the natural instincts around me, I, and turn it into, yeah, it is about me, but at the end of the day, it's about them because that's how it makes it about me. Mm. Everybody wins. Everybody wins in that modality. Um, and, and then the other thing I would say that comes out of mushroom management, and, and there's all kinds of things. If you read the blog, which I'd be completely flattered if anybody even read it anymore, but you know, <laughs> there are ideas, there are ideas about the dogs. Like yeah. you, have to, you, have to, you have to be able to articulate to people what their job is, how they function. They need to understand their relationship to one another. One of the mm. things about the dogs is that the mushers, or I should say the dog handlers, who, be, who in many, many cases are actually the mushers, they understand their dogs very well. They know what dogs should probably be in the front. They know what dogs want to be close to the sled. They know what dogs are going to be in the middle. They're kind of the pullers, as it were. And But they also know that the dog, they also leash these dogs up so that they understand their relationship to one another. It's actually fascinating. And I also thought, well, that was an interesting extrapolation of principle that's really important is that I think a lot of leaders don't understand where leadership kind of begins in management. Uh, leadership mm -hmm. management starts, it really starts. And a big part of management is articulation and clarity and, under, and people understanding roles, responsibilities, spans of control, interrelatedness, et cetera. So my belief is to be a good leader, you must be a good follower. If you do not understand what a follower needs, how can you be an effective leader? Mm. All right. So I believe that most great leaders you will find, even when they're in high test AA, AAA plus environments, can demonstrate dynamically, like on the moment, abilities to follow others because they understand what their role is. They understand, oh, I, I need to be here now. Let's talk about 2020 and the workplace right now. Mm -hmm. Who are those mushers? that you're following? Well, Nadella, I mean, you know, the CEO of, uh, of Microsoft is clearly a musher and I've talked to people, I do not know him. Uh, I wish I did, but I don't. Um, uh, I've talked to people who do know him or have do work for him. And based on what they've told me about his leadership practices and what have you, he's absolutely a musher. And, <clears throat> and I think, look what he's done. Look what he's done with that company. I mean, it was, look, I love Bill Gates. I admire the heck out of him, right? Um, Steve Ballmer, but but I love Gates, right? And <clears throat> neither of those, and both of those guys built these, this massive franchise, right? But it's nothing compared to what it is now. And mm. that that distance that they've traveled as a company, particularly in terms of market cap, has all has all been under the new CEO, who's not that new there's anymore. The, right? There's the growth executive right there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Play, yeah, playing in the growth. Yeah, yep. Right. Well, he he exactly because I think yeah. the other guys again very talented. I mean, brilliant men. But 
they, A, they weren't good listeners in some ways. They had their ideas about what the franchise was all about. And most people will tell you in terms of inside baseball about Bill, it was very hard to knock him off of those ideas. Uh, Ballmer had the same, uh, had very similar points of view about the business. And the Dallas was like, I see all these other opportunities that I think we should be capturing or liberating the franchise really. And, you know, it was, he, you know, he knew how to get his people to follow him. And they've, I mean, they've unleashed like hundreds of billions of dollars of market cap under his leadership. So I think he's one for sure. I, I'll be honest with you. I've seen many more examples of not, not musher in 2020. Um, I'll, I'll put a little plug in for our, our healthcare workers and our and our, our essential workers. I, I've seen a, I see a lot of leadership at that level, a lot of leadership, and people are making, you know, business for the most part is not about life or death decisions, and yet these are life or death decisions every single day, mm. and they are they are figuring out how to prioritize the needs of the individual with the needs of the family that surround that individual who's ill, with the needs of the enterprise, the hospital, the system, whatever. I mean, I'm fascinated how well these people are performing under this incredible dress. When you think about the seat you sit in and the amount of businesses that you've had relationship to, what do you think the workplace needs more of right now? Again, I think the culture of caretaking has become not just a, a, a fad, but has become an important dimension of measuring executive leaders. So I think that's been good and more of that is good. Um, I think, um, I'm seeing, you know, the pandemic has accelerated, uh, self-service systems, uh, do it yourself kinds of modalities so that smart people can get things done in a smart way without having to work through a lot of bureaucracy. Um, I'm seeing certain elements of what in the technology industry you might call agile cultures or agile performance models becoming more increasingly part of mainstream ways of getting work done. Um, but what I will tell you is I, in my opinion, um, I think this idea that we've all learned, we've all been socialized to remote working via video conferencing and that that is good enough. I think that is wrong. I think that is a dangerous and slippery slope, uh, because I think human beings <clears throat> don't have relationships with screens. You and I can only have so much of a relationship through this, through this environment. Mm. And I think that personal interaction in terms of being in the office. And I'm not saying people have to be in the office all the time. Uh, I think we'll probably end up going back to a, some kind of a hybrid model, but being in office and being in proximity, I think creates opportunities for young executives to model more senior executives. It gives, a, um, a particularly for the millennials, and actually I can't speak for sort of the middle generation, but especially for the boomers, the sense of community and camaraderie that comes with being in a physical place is super, super important, I think, to interestingly enough, sort of the old guard and the young guard. Mm. And so I think that we've got to figure out, we cannot believe that remote work or certainly that video conferencing, it should be the new normal. You know, one thing that I was also thinking about, uh, we, we didn't, we didn't touch on this, but I think it's very interesting, especially as I relate to this whole brand of the warriors at work. You know, I believe philosophically that we're so much more than our professional attributes. How does intuition and gut play into leadership from your standpoint? Intuition, I think, plays, well, first of all, I think intuition is, I don't think it's necessarily well understood, but it's an incredibly powerful part of human psychology, part of human, the mind. Because I think you're in intuition, you're taking all kinds of variables and sort of munging them together with certain experiences that you have that kind of validate or invalidate maybe other types of stimulus that are coming in. And you're kind of saying, I think this, and you don't necessarily even have all the facts. That's intuition or that's gut. I think that, you know, look, I, when it comes to leading, there are such things as natural leaders, but you, I think to be a really effective leader in the long haul, I think you need to be, you need to intellectualize some of that. You need to know what parts of what you, your gut are right and why, and then begin to build a framework of reasoning for that. Mm. So that becomes sort of the sort of the foundation for what what is what does good leadership look like as opposed to leading by gut. You're always in the moment. You know the bad example of that is, for instance, um, the cultures of personality. Leaders who 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 don't really intellectualize their leadership ability end up being leaders by cult of personality almost in, almost inevitably. And cultures of personality are not scalable. 
I think that they're inherently dangerous. They certainly are not about team. They tend to be about I. Mm. Um, really, really bad examples of that could be full-blown autocracy or even like out in the world of history, megalomania. So people who are instinctively or always run by their gut and don't can't really explain why they think a certain way, I, I, I over time, I would challenge them in terms of their actual ability to lead. Yeah. So what you're saying is philosophically what I, it, it's, it's a yes. And it's not an either or we, we all have access to both sides of this. And what I find is that people are over indexing to one or the other. And what I'm saying, when you're at your best and you are knocking it out of the park and you're having a really powerful, effective day, you're making smart choices, you're making good decisions, sound judgment, you're creating collaborative conversations, you're actually activating both sides of yourself. You're not only tapping into that intellectual framework, but you're also inviting how you're feeling, how you're sensing, how you're picking up things in a situation or an experience. But by the same token, we are also much more in control of our impulses when we've got a balance. We know when to pause. We know when we say, wait, hold on a second. I want to I want to sit with this for a little bit. We know when to be very decisive. We've just got more access to things. And I think about all of the examples that you've provided. I mean, you didn't use the word in the framing intuition and gut, but what you were doing is you were sensing and assessing you're putting it into an intellectual framework that allows for you to understand what are those patterns of behavior that right. allow for you to be successful. And when I'm going off course, what's going on? So, uh, so that, okay. So uh, that's right on. And, and uh, I would actually say that one of the elements of, of, of good leadership or even great leadership is, is sort of repeatability consistency. So again, if you're always going from your gut, that means that you're using sort of your unseen tool, decision-making tool that sits inside your mind, your body, however you want to look at it. And then you have this sort of variable stimulus. Yeah. But if you can, if you can regularly be present and regularly show that you make the right decision and regularly show, like you say, whether that's that pregnant pause or the opportunity for someone to speak who's not speaking or whatever, however you're sort of leading and conducting at the moment uh, and do that on a consistent basis, I think people will see you as not just a good leader, but an exceptional leader. Um, so you, I, I think repeatability um, and consistency are critical elements of trust. And I think trust is probably one of the cornerstones to great leadership. So let's, let's talk about you. The, the trust is a, is a perfect segue to the question that I'd love to ask. And I, I ask this to everybody that comes on here, because I want to talk about Dave, the person. So when you think about yourself and my philosophy is, you know, we're all in service to each other, trying to create this movement of doers and thinkers that are elevating and activating the greatest part of themselves. But I recognize there are crucial people in our communities that keep us accountable to that belief system. Who are those people that are keeping you accountable to your growth and evolution? Uh, personally, I, my spouse, um, you know, I have the good fortune of having a pretty big fan in my spouse. And so, and I think she, she gets me and I think she understands uh, certainly the aspirations I have for myself. And uh, so I think she's a huge accountability partner. Um, I have a coach. I've actually, like I said, Ed and Dick were coaches. I've had a couple other coaches. I have a coach now who is um, very hands off, but man, he is all hands on if I need it. <laughs> Almost like, oh, I really wish I hadn't made this phone call. But that's okay because I want that kind of unfiltered feedback and I want that recalibration. Um, you know, I think that that's incredibly important, I think, to growth is that you're always open to growing. Um, you know, my brother, I have two brothers, but one of them um, also kind of gets me. And he and I talk regularly about uh, challenges I should, I'm having. Um, you know, I, I obviously uh, have to be a little careful sometimes depending on the context of the challenge. But uh, because it might be, you know, private or public company information, mm -hmm. but, but he, he's been super, super useful. I have several select friends that I use as accountability partners and, uh, I actually belong to a men's group. And so underneath, so after all of the things I've just said about accountability that tend to be more professional accountability. Now my spouse obviously is accountable. She, she holds me accountable a lot of stuff. Uh, but spiritually, like who am I? How am I growing? I've had the really good fortune for the last almost four years of being in a very a small men's group, of five men uh, that came out of a, a retreat that I went on, uh, like I said, about five years ago. 
And uh, those guys I talk to or and or meet with every other week, and there's no judgment, which is a big part, I think, of being able to speak truthfully and honestly to mm. others about what's on your mind and the challenges that you're having. There's no that's for I mean, that's not even a rule. Um, I mean that that is a rule based on some of the guidelines of the group that I, be, I belong to, but that's just something that we practice in principle. There's no judgment. And so you feel free to talk about the things that, you know, really think you're holding yourself or bothering you or holding you back or whatever. Mm. So, yeah. So I, I'm really lucky to have a number of people that I go to. I, I would love for you to share, you know, obviously a big part of this is we, none of us are perfect beings. We're all again, growing, evolving and working with the contours of our life. What are you working on in yourself? How many, how many people are going to hear this? Um, <laughs> a couple of thousand. <laughs> uh, I'm always working on being more present. Always, always, always. I'm a, I've been a meditation practitioner for at least three, maybe four years now. Very committed to the practice. I'm very committed to being better at, fi- at expressing my gratitude um, and appreciating all the different dimensions of my life that have brought me, that continue to bring me great fortune. You know, I do some, I do some little things too that just kind of keep my mind right and keep my, kind of keep my back straight as it were. Uh, you know, kind of like the general who talks about making your bed every day. Sometimes somebody might be in that bed when I get up because I get up very early in the morning, so I can't do that. But I, um, I always make uh, coffee for myself and my spouse every morning. That's always set up and I always, you know, do something in the kitchen, usually something around the dishwasher because I want to, com- I want to set my life in motion with intention mm. and little things like that are just, you know, incredibly gratifying in some ways. Right. Because I know, for instance, what I'm doing benefits somebody else. Mm. Um, and I know that for myself, it creates almost kind of a mental health clean sheet. Like the coffee's always going to be ready. The dishwasher is always going to be empty. You know, the glasses or plates or whatever are always going to be where they need to be. And that kind of helps set me up in a, orderly way as it were so um but i I, so i guess since you put it in the context of working on i'm always working to lower the sense of chaos in my Mm. life um and i don't have that much i'm blessed compared to many many well compared to literally like several billion other people in the world i don't have that much complexity or chaos but i do work very diligently every day to try to get my arms around that you know and kind of own it you made me reflect on the coffee and bed making very differently. Thank you for that. I have to have a chat with my husband. <laughs> um, so here, here's my final question for you, Dave. Uh, you know, my my whole belief is that you know we all have some real natural skill and magic within. And when I think about warrior, it's about being a brave and experienced soldier that exhibits things like courage and optimism inside and outside of the office. What is your warrior magic? Well, I think professionally that it's got to be team first. There's, there's nobody survives alone. And I think generosity of spirit, we can all Mm. teach, we can all teach one another something and we can all be taught. So if we're on a journey where we're learning, you know, you almost have an obligation if you know something to share it with others. And certainly because we're on a journey where we're learning, you're always, you should be open to inquiry. You should be open to input. You know, we what we really want is for each other to manifest our best selves. Oh, what a great way to end this conversation for each one of us to manifest our best selves. So, Dave, I'm so appreciative that you took the time to be in this conversation with me and that you shared so much about your leadership philosophies, your experience in the world. And there's just so much wisdom in this conversation. So I'm really appreciative of you taking the time to be with me. Thanks, everybody, for listening to another episode of Warriors at Work and letting us be a part of your warrior journey. You can ask questions and make suggestions for future topics at jc at geniecoomber.com. Connect with me personally on LinkedIn and Instagram and join us on the Warrior Conversations channel on YouTube and at the Warrior Magic Community page on Facebook. You can find links to all these places on my website, geniecoomber.com, And most importantly, be sure to tell friends about us, subscribe, rate, and review us on iTunes, Spreaker, and Spotify. It helps others find the show and puts more warrior magic out into the world.